Well, good morning. Well, welcome again, as I say every Labor Day to all my friends that don't have a friend with a mountain house, lake house, or beach house. We're uh, glad you're here with us, and I hope you make some friends. And when you sign up for a community group to have a lake house, a beach house, or something else really nice. Hey, we're glad you guys are a part of today. Uh, we're in a series started last week called Paper Walls, and the tagline is moving beyond the excuses that hold you back. Now, here's the reality. When you hear that title, uh, moving beyond the excuses that hold you back, and you hear we're talking, uh, doing a series on excuses, immediately your first thought is, this would be a great series for someone else, right? I know some people I should invite to come to this next week, but the truth is, we all have them, right? We have excuses. Some of them are big excuses that we know we have. Others are smaller excuses that we don't know that we have, but everybody around us knows that we have them. In fact, yesterday I was at a soccer game for my youngest daughter, and uh, I was there, and I um, multiple times, out of the kindness of my heart, offered to help the referees. I mean... Uh, on multiple occasions, I mean, they clearly, they did not have a good vantage point on what was happening. And I just, I offered, the, every time they denied too, it was so weird. It's like they didn't even want my help. I mean, I had a great view of offsides. And so multiple times I just helped them just a little bit, just a little nudge. One time I might've stood up and my wife might've got embarrassed and reminded me that I'm a pastor. That might or might not have happened. But here's the internal dialogue. The internal dialogue was like, this is not fair to these girls. Like, this is just not fair, right? This is there, this, there. But the reality is, that was just my excuse. This is what we've been talking about, the idea that paper walls are, they look real from a distance, right? But when you get up close, you realize it's just paper. It's not real. But I, I think that was just my excuse. The, the reality was, it was just annoying me, right, what was happening. And we do this all the time. We do it in little things, but we do it in big things as well, where we have excuses that we tell ourselves, that we tell others, and those excuses at times, the line gets really blurry and they become our reasons, so to speak, but they're not really reasons. They're just masquerading. They're excuses masquerading as reasons. And again, from a distance, the paper wall looks real. I was, uh, had dinner this week with a family in our church, and uh, I, I won't name any names, but while we were sitting there, Stephen Weeks said to me that... <laughs> He said, man, uh, we were talking, he said, man, that sounds a lot like an excuse. And he looked at me and, uh, and, and he said to me, he was in the service last week. He said, my pastor told me we shouldn't be making excuses. <laughs> like my favorite thing is when you guys weaponize my sermons against me. I just want you to know that. But it happens, right? Like there are times that we make excuses. And again, sometimes we don't really realize we're doing it. And sometimes it seems like it's in some inconsequential area of life. But sometimes it's not. And here's what I said last week, that an excuse is just a well-dressed lie that we tell ourselves. Now, we make it sound way less than that, so it doesn't hurt our feelings, but it's just a well-dressed lie that we tell ourselves. And the last thing that I said last week as we were wrapping up part one is that excuses will keep you and me from fully experiencing God's purpose. Now, if you want to go back and listen to part one, I would encourage you to, but I know this to be true. There is something that your heavenly father has for you, has for me. And one of the things that will prevent us from fully experiencing what God intends for us, the plan that he has for us, the purpose he has for us, is when we live behind a paper wall of excuses. So one of the first things we have to do is we have to actually acknowledge that we have some of those excuses. So I want to start by asking you a question. I want to put this name on the screen. How many of you, uh, don't tell anybody if you know who this is, how many of you in the room would say by raising your hands that you know who this is? I don't see any. Maybe there's one. None? Okay, let me give you another name. How many of you know who this is? Raise your hands. All right, what did he do? It was like, blah, blah, blah. It was like a wrong answer in church is really embarrassing, right? He's the founder of Apple, <laughs> just in case you didn't know. So how, how many of you know this guy was worth a lot of money? You know that, right? How many of you know that you're, you have some of that in your pocket right now? So let me, let me go back to the other guy uh, that I put his name on there. Ronald Wayne and Steve Jobs were both actually, they had some of the same story, that they're both founders of Apple. So why is it that everybody knows Steve Jobs' name, but very few people, maybe none in this room, knew who Ronald Wayne is? That's kind of interesting, right? So the reason that most of us haven't heard of Ronald Wayne is because in 1976, he decided to sell his 10% stake in Apple back to Steve Jobs. And the third owner was a guy named Steve Wozniak. You probably heard that name as well. He sold his 10% stake in Apple back to these two guys for, listen to this, $800. Oh, 
oh, shot to the heart, right? Like $800, 10% stake in Apple. Now, fast forward to today, that 10% will be worth over 200,000. Wait, no, no, that's not it. 200 million. No, no, that's not it either. $200 billion. <laughs> oh, man, don't you just want to be his friend right now? Like $200 billion. Now, I don't have a category for that, so I did a little Google research in case this helps because this will probably make it make sense for you. That's 2.2 tons of $100 bills. That's how much that is. Now, I want you just to imagine for a second. I want you to imagine that Ronald's dad had a crystal ball. Now, I know we don't believe in those, but just go with me for the sake of the illustration, right? I want you to imagine he had a crystal ball. He knew where this whole story was going to go and where, what was going to play out. And I want you to imagine that he decided, he said, you know what? Here's the thing. I don't want to interfere with Ronald's life. I just, I love my son exactly the way he is. I don't want to get involved and interfere in his future. So I'm not going to tell him about this because I love him too much. You're like, that's not love. That's something else. Like that, like, that's like, dad, no, you got to tell me if there's something that alters the trajectory of my future, my life, everything that I know, you got to tell me that's not love. That's absolutely ludicrous, isn't it? So You've heard what I'm about to say. In fact, we've said it many times from this stage. I've said it many times. And what I'm about to say is true. You've heard, you've heard us say this, that God loves you just the way you are. In fact, I just want some of you to, in a very real way, I want you to recognize you can receive this reality. Like, isn't it true that in life sometimes we feel like we've got to perform in a certain way for God to love us? But the truth is Jesus already performed on the cross everything that was needed. You don't have to do anything for God to love you. God does love you the way you are. This is a 100% true statement. But this statement, this phrase alone, fails to capture the whole picture. And you've heard the rest. You know the rest. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. That's the rest of the story. In other words... Our Heavenly Father, God, will not allow us to live behind a paper wall of excuses that prevent us from something that he knows that he can see in our future that is good for us, the life that he intends for us. He knows the things that will hurt us. He knows the relationships, the people, the decisions that will hurt us, the things that we, if we step into them, they will hurt us, and the things if we stand back and don't get involved, they will hurt us. He knows all of those things, and he will not allow us to stand behind a paper wall of excuses and miss and be prevented from having the life that he intends for us. In fact, what I'm trying to say is God might interfere in our lives every once in a while. In fact, he's tried to do it at times and perhaps we weren't paying attention. God might interfere with our lives actually because he loves you. There, there are things that God wants for you that he wants for me, and there are moments where he will interfere in our lives. If we're listening, if we're paying attention, there's a divine interruption. There's a divine interference that is designed to actually set us into the future that he has for us. He doesn't want us to miss the, the 10% ownership where he, when he knows where it's going to go in some arena of our lives. So the number one language when you look at the scriptures, all throughout the Old Testament, but particularly in the New Testament, when you look at the language that is assigned and attributed to God, the number one uh, phrase or word, excuse me, that is used for God is the word Father. Now, let me just stop there. When I say God is Father, there's something that comes to your mind, and it's somehow, some way is connected to your relationship or lack of relationship with your earthly father. So, if your earthly father is amazing, my dad is my hero. And I know that's not a lot of people's stories. My dad's an incredible man. But if your dad is amazing, here's what I will tell you. Your heavenly father is, immeasurable, is, is immeasurably better than that. But for some of you, that's not your story. Your dad wasn't good. Your dad wasn't present. Your dad, like it felt like you could never quite measure up to the standard or his words were harsh or whatever the story was. If, if your dad was, well, not so awesome, I would say your heavenly father is immeasurably better than that. He is categorically different than our good fathers, than our bad fathers here on earth. And here's what the scriptures say, that he is a good father and every good father wants to give good gifts to their children. So if God, our good father, knew that right now in my life and in your life, we have some paper wall excuses, 
Some things that we've told ourselves are reasons, but they're really just excuses. And we have some things that we're living behind. I wonder if perhaps that good God would allow our lives to be interrupted. Say, hey, hey, don't, don't sell the stock, man. Don't, don't get in that relationship. Don't pull the ripcord too early on faith. Because you're in a tough season, but don't do it. What, a, a good God, I don't think, would stand by passively and allow us to live behind a paper wall of excuses and miss out on a wildly different kind of life. So it it makes me think, what would a good God do? Like right here for us, what would a good God do? How would he respond to my excuses? The ones that I know I have, the ones that I don't, how would he respond to your excuses are paper walls. And And I got thinking, I wonder if he would tell us a parable. Because that's what Jesus did in the New Testament in a very similar situation. Now, what you know about Jesus, if you don't know this, the scriptures say this, that Jesus is the very representation of God. That says, if you want to know what God is like, then you look to Jesus. Jesus not only was the representation of God, somehow he was God. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three in one in a way that my human mind and probably all of our human minds will never fully be able to wrap our minds around that reality. But Jesus was the representation of God. And from time to time, people would ask Jesus difficult questions. And and, and sometimes when they ask those difficult questions, Jesus, in response, would tell a parable. Now, oftentimes in these parables, there was a really obvious truth that everybody in the audience, no matter where they were in their spiritual journey, they could get it. Because oftentimes, as you look at Jesus' crowd, there were people who were followers of Jesus, people that were skeptics, people that were trying to figure it out, all different walks of life. So there were obvious truths, but then often there was also some not-so-obvious truths that he would gather up his, in, his inside group afterward and say, now let me tell you what I really mean. Let me tell you the truth hidden underneath the truth. Now, some of you know this, but a parable is a made-up story. A made-up story in order to make a point to a very specific group of people. So, I don't know, maybe if Jesus was looking at our paper wall of excuses, he'd tell us a parable like the one that I'm going to read today. It's one of the most famous parables in the scripture, the parable of the talent. Some of you have read it many times. Uh, Perhaps you're newer to the scripture, but I'm going to read this parable, but here's what I want you to do. I want you just to try to filter the reading of this parable today through your own paper wall of excuses right here in modern times. As you lead your family, as you, as you work out your life at work, as you work out your life at school or on that ball team or whatever it is, whatever the paper wall of excuses that you have in your life that I have in my life. So here's where it picks up. Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 14. And I'm, I'm reading out of a little bit different version today. And I'll tell you why in a second. It says, for it will be like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, he gave five talents. Now, let me just stop there and say this isn't like he gave. It's like, all right, you got, you got juggling. You got, you're going to be good with an Excel spreadsheet. You know, you're going to be good at soccer. You're going to be a really good strategic business plan. It's not like those kind of talent nunchucks if you go far enough back to appreciate Napoleon Dynamite. It's not like those kind of skills or talents. This was actually a measure of money. So when he gave him this measure of money, one talent was what we, what we call 6,000 denarii. That was one day's wage. So if you start to kind of do this math, this was a massive amount of money. This could have been as much as 15 to 16 years of wages, just one talent. Like some scholars say that if you kind of tried to put it in modern day math, it could be anywhere from a million to $2 million per talent. So like when this guy gives five talents, this is a load of money. This is like bring in the armored camels. Like for the, This is a big, big deal. And so he says, to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to another he gave one. And then he says something really important that I want to come back to. He says, to each according to his ability. He says, then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once. He traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But and this is where if it's a movie... The score, the music score changes, bum, 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 like it changes. The mood changes, but he who had received the one talent went and he dug in the ground and he hid his master's money. Continues, it says, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. Remember, this is a massive sum of money. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, which now that I've described how much money this is, when he says, you've been, oh, 
thanks for being faithful over the little, just those several millions of dollars. What this tells you is, in the story, this master is rich, extremely rich. He says, since you've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. And then he says this phrase, enter into the joy of your master. Now, I read this passage several times preparing for today, and I kept getting hung on this phrase, enter into the joy of your master. Now, in these parables, there was always someone that represented God, and there was always someone that represented the audience. In many ways, you and, now, now, you and I have now become a part of the audience because I'm sharing this story that Jesus shared with his audience, and you, by nature of 2,000 years away, have become a part of the audience. But in this story, the master is representative of God. And this is fascinating. As I thought about this phrase, enter into the joy of your master, there's a direct connection between our faithfulness, just showing up, like whatever you've got, whatever you have with you, just showing up, being faithful, and the joy of the master, or let's say it this way, the joy of the father. Like in some of you, if you hear nothing else I'm saying today, you just need to put this in your pocket for a rainy day. Because some of you right now, you just feel like you don't have anything to offer. You don't have any emotional bandwidth left. Like some of you students, I've, I've been praying for our middle school, high school students, elementary students as well, so much anxiety, which affects the home. It affects everyone. Like, there's so much anxiety. For some of you going back to work, like in your marriages right now, that just the level of anxiety in our world. I'm thinking about this. You can enter into the joy of your master. You, you may feel like you have nothing left in your emotional tank. You may feel like financially you're in a terrible place. You're at risk in some portion of your life or in a relationship. And here's, here's a beautiful thing. Just be faithful with what you have. You may say, God, this is all I have in this invitation that with all you have, just be faithful. To show up in prayer going, God, I don't have anything left but just a plea to you. This is a beautiful thought that enter into the joy of your father by just being faithful. He says, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Then he continues. He says, and he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I've made two talents more. Again, a massive sum of money. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He uses that phrase again. Again, a direct connection between what you have because these two individuals had different things. They didn't have the same capacity. They didn't have the same amounts. They didn't have the same thing to offer back to their master. So be faithful with what you have and enter into the joy of your father. I wonder what that would feel like this morning, just to enter into the joy of your father. You know, he's not mad. Like everybody wants a mad God in the world. He's not mad at you. Enter into the joy of your father. Faithfulness gets us there. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I'm going to come back to that. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But the master answered to him, and I'm just telling you, this sounds so harsh. The master answered to him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own, at least with interest. He's like, at the very least, like, you just hide it in the ground, I get nothing. And then he says this, and again, this feels so intense, and I just want you to feel whatever you feel when I read this now telling you that this is in some way representative of God our Father. He says, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has will be more given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken. That sounds harsh. Honestly, I can take a stab at explaining what this verse means, but scholars much smarter than me have not come to a consensus on what these verses mean. But let me just tell you what is clear. What is clear in these last couple of verses, at some level, when we don't do something to grow and expand what God has placed in us and in our hands, that's what this, this parable is about. At some level, when we don't do something to grow and expand, in other words, when we start to be, become about, this is kind of for me and 
I'm thinking about me and I'm, I'm self-centered in me. When we don't do something to grow and expand what has been placed in us and what has been placed in our hands, then we lose it. At some level, that's what is clear. Again, scholars all disagree on the different levels and what it means and what of this is spiritual inheritance and what is real and all of that. But here's what I would say. There is some type of spiritual inheritance. There is some type of inheritance that your father, God, has for you that has your name on it, that if you and I aren't faithful with what he has put in us and put in our hands, somehow that, is, that spiritual inheritance that has your name on it will be reassigned and given to someone else. And I don't fully understand that, but that's what this passage teaches. Now, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking, man, if I'm listening to me teach that, what would my response be? Like if I'm someone that's on the edge thinking, I don't know if I'm doing the God thing anyway, or someone that's coming back, here's, there's two really big, this is my first thought, there's two ways to respond to some, some passage like this. The first one is you can be bothered by that God or that reality, and you can actually let that become your paper wall of excuses. You can say, you know what, see, that's, that's the thing, Chris. I don't want to believe in a God like that, a God that doesn't kind of do things the way I think he should do things. That, that, that can be your response. It can become your excuse for why you say, well, you know, that's why I don't, I don't do this. That's why I don't do religion. I, I remember hearing Francis Chan ask this question. Yes, he's a famous uh, pastor or was a famous pastor, Christian leader, thought leader. He said this. He said, if you disagreed with God, would you still obey? Like, I want you to think about this. This is such a fascinating question because underneath this question, if you disagree with God, in other words, I come to some truth about God that is a truth about God. If I disagree with God, would I still obey him? Because underneath this question really is a deeper question, and it comes to this idea, am I God or is he God? Because if I only follow God when I agree with him, then I'm saying I am actually God and he's not. That's a wild place to be, isn't it? Think about this. Do we only, do I only, I'm thinking about this for me, circle Chris up in this. Do I only follow God if he says stuff I like and I agree with? Because that's really kind of Western Christianity. Like at the end of the day, what the scriptures teach is that I am made in the image of God. What Western Christianity tells us sometimes is we're going to conform God to our image. He'll be our consumer God. We'll use him when we need him. He'll be our genie in a bottle. But listen, this is a great question, a piercing question. You come to a passage of scripture where you find something uncomfortable. Say, if you disagreed with God, would you still obey? So you could, in some situation like this, say, you know what? I, I, I'm, here's the deal. I'm bothered by that God and that reality. A second way you could respond to this is you could just say, I'm going to make sure it's not my reality. Like, so what if we just did a kind of an inventory? What has God put in me? What are the skills? What are the, the gift sets? What are the, the influence? What are all the things I have? What has God placed in my hands? And I'm just going to make sure that I do everything in my power to be faithful with it. I'm just going to do everything in my power to make sure that there is something that God has given that he intends for me that I'm going to be faithful with it. So my suggestion of those two is the latter. There's some kind of spiritual inheritance that's connected to you and I just being faithful with what God has given us, with what God has placed in our hands. And then Jesus, if you think he was interesting there, listen to how he closes out the parable. He closes it out with a bang. He says this. He says, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, if you meet, make excuses, you're going to hell. Okay, that's not what he really said, but it was pretty harsh, right? Like, that, like, when he says this, what he's saying is there will be, like, when you and I live behind a paper wall of excuses, when, when we live behind this, there are massive consequences in our lives. So here's what I want to do, the time that we have remaining. I want to make four observations about this parable. I couldn't figure out how to track through it uh, fully, but I want to make four quick observations. The first one is this. This is not a story about money. I just want to say that this is a story about stewarding or managing, if that's a better word, what we have been given. And this is including but not limited to our resources. This is not just about money. This is about taking everything that we have, your actual talent. If you have nunchuck skills, congratulations. You can use them for the glory of God. I'm not sure how. Like whatever skills you have been given, this is your influence. For some of you, you have incredible strategic minds. You have an entrepreneurial spirit. You know how to start things. You know how to move things, right? For some of you, you are incredible relationally. You are an incredible counselor. You can step into a space of emotional pain and help navigate that, and that is a gift that you've been given to steward. It's 
It's everything we have. It's your relationships. Do you know sometimes in life you can move far just because you have relationships and connections? That's one of the things that some of you have been given at an extraordinary level. And this is, what's, this is what this story is about, that everything that is in us, everything that is in our hands and that's placed in us as a human, this story is about being faithful with those things. So the question is, are you? Am I? Are, are we being faithful? The second observation is this. This is not a story about equal outcomes. See, we're not all given the same talents and abilities and opportunities, right? Like I, this little phrase, according to his ability, is key to understanding this entire parable that Jesus is telling. See, the one talent guy wasn't held accountable for what the five talent guy had received. And I'm just telling you, this is great news, this is really good news because some of you are looking around at some portion of your life and there's somebody who seems to be way better at everything they do than you are, right? But you're not going to be held accountable for what they have. You're not going to be held accountable for the gift sets that they have. Like, listen, no one expects you to play golf like Phil Mickelson. <laughs> some of you are like, oh, but I do, but you don't. <laughs> you don't, right? Like, you're not going to be expected to play ball like LaMelo ball. Like, you just aren't. You're not expected to decorate like Chip and Joanne, although that'd be amazing. You're not expected to direct tra traffic like Scott Baker. For those of you who know, that's shameless plug right there for our guest services team. Like, you know there are people in your life that are just really good at things. And you're looking at them and comparing yourself, and you're not, you're not going to be held accountable to what's in their hands or what's in their life. You're going to be held accountable, and I'm going to be held accountable to what was given to me. I heard a pastor say this one time, and it just resonated with me, that we're not going to get to heaven one day. And God say, why weren't you more like Paul? Why weren't you more like Solomon? Why weren't you more like whoever, some famous Bible character or some other hero in your life? Listen, God knows what he put in us. He knows what he put in you. He knows what he put in my hands. He knows what he put in your hands. And he knows what the possible outcome is based on his input. God knows that. You and I will not give an account for what our neighbor, our spouse, our coworker, parent has. We will not be measured against other people's talent. We will not be measured against their ability, their opportunity, but by what God has placed in us and in our hands. And I'm just telling you, this is liberating for me. Because like, I think about, I have so many pastor friends that are so much more talented than me. Man, and here's the thing. Like, it's all out there. Everything we do is, like, recorded, and it's out there. I'm like, man, that guy is such an incredible speaker or a great leader. I've got friends that I look, and I'm like, they're just better dads than I am. They're better humans than I am. They don't yell at the soccer field, right? Like, I've got so many people in my life that if I look, I just, I can tell they're so good. Have you ever been around that person that's just like the super mom or super dad? Like, while you were sitting at the beach in the chair, they saved your child from the riptide? You know what I mean? <laughs> You're like, hey, here's my life, right? Thanks, guy. I'll give you a trophy for being the best dad ever because I'm not, right? If you, if you got, you ever been around the person at work? Like they seem to have, they don't require sleep and they only have great ideas. Like every time, every meeting, you're like, that's the best idea I've ever heard. And the boss says the same thing. Here's the great news. This is liberating. You will not be held accountable for what whoever they is have. You won't. But you and I will give an account. For what we're given. This is interesting. The stakes and the responsibility were much higher for the five talent guy. Like we look in the store and we're like, oh, look what that guy had. But listen, the stakes were way higher. The millions and millions and millions that he was entrusted. The stakes were higher. And let me just say, tell you this. Some of you in this room, you're five talent people. God has given you a lot. You're really smart. You're really connected. Some of you are very affluent. God has given you a lot. You're great relationally. And in those spaces, to those that have been given much, much will be required. One of the sneaky things about excuses, this is my third observation, is that the nature of an excuse is that they all seem reasonable to us. Isn't it true? Like, you, like in fact, you would, you would give an excuse for your excuse. You're like, no, no, that's perfectly justifiable. The referee did, in fact, need my help. I mean, they were off sides, right? They all seem reasonable to us. And out of the gate, as Jesus is telling this parable, everyone sees what's happening except for the guy that's in the parable. Like everyone, like everyone in Jesus' audience, every one of you, as I read this story, you could see that this guy is making an excuse. It's clear that this guy, when he comes back 
with the, the guy with the least, he, he was given the least when he reports back to Jesus, not only does he bring no interest, the thing that he brings back is an excuse. He brings back one of these. And, 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 and if you watch how it unfolds, he says, hey, I knew you were a hard man. You're reaping where you did not sow. You know, I, I know how you are. And, and ultimately what he does is he blames the master for what happened. We talked about this last week that sometimes the way excuses work is we blame something internal on something external. I said everywhere we go, there we are, but sometimes we find an external thing to blame the thing on. This is what's happening. In other words, he says, before I tell you what I did with the money that you gave to me, I just want you to know that it's really not my fault. Because really, Master, the way you are, think about this, the way you are affected the way I responded. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's, it's not my fault. It's, it's, you're a harsh, you, have a, you have a high standard. So the way you are affected the way I am. And as us looking onto this as an audience, every one of us see what is happening. The only person in the room that couldn't see what was happening was him because the nature of excuses is they all seem reasonable to us. And when we look at this man, we can see his, but we can't see our own. And here's what's true. Most of us do some form of this parable every single day, every single week, if not every single day of our lives. And here's what it looks like. Well, if my husband would just, well, if my wife would just, if she would just stop or she would just, if my boss wouldn't, if my church wouldn't, if, if the president wouldn't, we, if someone else if I just weren't in so much debt, and, and, if, and if my boss would just give me a raise, and if I could get the bonus, isn't it interesting? We can't see it. We can see it clearly when I read this parable, but we can't see it in our own lives. The nature of an excuse is that they all seem reasonable to us. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, they're just paper walls. They're just excuses, and they prevent us from stepping into something incredible that God has for us. It's interesting, though, even though this guy starts there in this place of kind of, hey, it's your fault, the way you are affected the way I am, he finally admits, he says, I was afraid. I was afraid. Now, this is huge. And please, please, please don't overlook this. Almost every excuse in our life, if you consider it somewhere behind it, there's a fear. In fact, I would tell you this. I would tell you that there is this, that these two things, fear and excuses, are inextricably linked, which leads me to my last observation, that fear fuels our excuses. In fact, I would say this. If you can start, if I can start to be honest about what my fears are, if I could just start to circle up, what am I, like, I know I feel anxious, I know I feel frustrated, I know I feel angry, but what am I really afraid of? What's driving that? If you begin to circle up, if I begin to circle up what my fears are, then you will take a massive step towards tearing down the paper wall of excuses because excuses and fears are always linked together. In fact, you can reverse engineer it. You, you can take this thing the other direction. If you do a deep dive, if you were to think, like today, maybe you've got some that you've already recognized. I kind of make an excuse for myself in this arena. If you do a deep dive on your excuse, somewhere close by, lurking just underneath the surface, will be, I promise you, a fear of some sort. It's true of me. It's true of you because these two things are always linked. It's interesting. One of the things that God says the most to his followers throughout the scripture is fear not. I wonder why. It's because when we have fear in our lives, fear leads to excuses. And excuses prevent us from stepping in to something that your good heavenly father and my good heavenly father want for us. They prevent us. Some of the greatest things that will happen in your life Fear will allow you to create an excuse and keep you from that thing. Some of the things that you need to cut ties from, fears of cutting ties. What are you afraid of? You're afraid that if you cut ties, you'll no longer be in the group. And you'll create an excuse and you'll stay in it and you'll miss something God has for you. And I'll miss something God has for me. I was reminded of this. I, I was able to visit my mom and dad 
last week, just a quick visit, and my mom reminded me this story. When I was, uh, when I was in high school, middle school, high school, we had this dog that was just bad to the bone. Like, he was just, he was half Chesapeake Bay Retriever, half Pitbull, and he just walked up in the room, and you're like, oh, yeah, he's in charge. Like, you would not roll, want to roll up on him in a dark alley. Like, so he was a protector of all of us, but he was just a bad, bad dog. Now, compare that to my dogs now. I'm not sure they would survive in the wild. Like, if I let my dogs outside, they're, like, standing at the door, like, let me back in the air conditioning. Like, so completely different, right? I modernized my dog, but this dog was just incredible. And so I was the youngest of three boys, so by the time I was in middle school and high school, my brothers were out of the house. And so sometimes my parents were working when I'd get home. So I would come into the house, and we lived in a rural setting, and sometimes I'd be freaked out a little bit. So I would always take Duke, and I'd let him go in the house first. I mean, just going to do a little check, right? He's not an indoor dog, but he loved every opportunity. And so I remember this one time in particular. I think I'd come home from basketball practice. I let him in the house, and he starts kind of snaking through the room. So he goes to all the rooms, checks the rooms. My parents, the master bedroom was in the very back of the house, and it was the last room, and I really wasn't feeling anything around. I'm like, there's nobody, there's nobody here at our house or whatever. And Duke rounds the corner. And I've, listen, I had never seen this dog back down from anything, N- nothing. He rounded the corner, and he immediately started to growl. And I couldn't see what he was growling. And and the hair on on his back stood up, and I saw him back up. And I thought, oh, no, I'm going to die. Like I'm my fr- like I legit like I had this moment of panic. I'm like, what am I gonna do? Like like I'm here. I'm like got my gym shorts on. I got my dog. Like and so it's like now I've identified there's an intruder in our house, and he must. I don't know what's happening, but I'm I can just see Duke, and he is growling, and he's just backing up like this, and he is ferocious. And I don't know why I did this. In hindsight, this was not the right move. But at some point, I mustered up enough courage. I jumped out and I went, hey. And then at that moment, I realized I would have died had it been an intruder, but it wasn't. You know what he was looking at? He was looking at a mirror. (laughs) He's like, that is the baddest dog I have ever seen. You don't want to roll up on this dog in an alley, right? So so he had come around the corner. He'd never seen himself in the mirror. I guess he saw himself. He's like, whoa, 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 I have met my match, right? I did have to clean my pants. (laughs) Just going to tell you. I'm not sure I told my parents about that for a while, right? Let me tell you, let me tell you what's true of you and me. Some of us, the person that we fear the most is a person in the mirror. It just is. That's who we're wrestling with. That's who we're fighting. Something, the person in the, in the mirror is, is causing us fear, anxiety, insecurity. So I want to close out this way. I just want to ask, what do you fear? Because fear drives our paper wall of excuses when we don't even know it. If you can't acknowledge the fear, you want to acknowledge the paper excuse wall. If you can't acknowledge the excuses, you can't dig around and find out what the fear is. But what's your fear? You, is it embarrassment? Like, I fear failure. Like, the thought of standing before God and failing, that, like, that's a thing for me. I, 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 is it rejection? It's like, man, I, I mean, it's funny. It doesn't stop when you, you get out of middle school, right? We talked about this. You get into high school, you get into college, you get into your career. No one wants to be outside the circle, right? Do you, do you fear not living up to someone's expectations, your parents, your coach, your boss, your coworkers? And so it drives you. You fear change. You feel like God has told you to do something new, go to a new city, do a new thing. Do you fear change? What do you fear? You fear that if people really knew you, like, I mean, you got the well-dressed version of yourself on a Sunday, but if they really knew, they knew your past, if they knew what you did last week, if they knew who you were, what you're struggling with, that they wouldn't accept you. Because behind our fears, that's where we construct our paper wall of excuses. And if we're not careful, that's where we will live our lives. And it will prevent us from stepping into something that your and my good heavenly father has for us so i want you to close your eyes for just a second i want to pray over you but i just want you to think about it what do you fear does something come to your mind some of you need to go to a counselor and you won't and you've told yourself a thousand excuses of why you won't and why you haven't what do you fear some of you need to get in a community group you're like nah i tried that drove up and one of the people had a Trump sticker on their car. 
One of the people had a Biden sticker on the car. I'm out. What do you fear? Like, what, what's the fear that you get in a conversation that you can't end up in agreement with someone? Like, what is the thing that you fear? And I just want you to know that your Heavenly Father wants to step right into that space. So you don't have to fear. I'm a good God. I will walk with you. We're going to get rid of those paper wall excuses. And we're going to step into the life that I intend for you. So for just a moment, as I pray, I want you to say it too in whatever way you need to. Father, we just lift our fears. God, the ones we know we have, the ones we don't, that are connected to the excuses we know we have and the ones that we don't. God, will you just, uh, will you meet us in that? For those that feel hurt in some way by a person in their life that represents you, I pray that you would give them the courage to acknowledge the wisdom, God, to see what the fear is underneath it, the courage to acknowledge the excuses and the, and the, the willingness to move on through it. God, for those that know they need to take the interview, they know they need to, to exit the relationship because it's toxic. For those that know they need to hang on to the relationship because they were quitting too early just because it was hard. God, will you show them what their fears are and God, take away the excuses for every single one of us. We love you. We desperately need you. In Jesus' precious and powerful and resurrected name we pray.